One of the most important people in the Renaissance period, forget religion, was a man named Desiderius Erasmus. Um, and he was what we would, what's known as today, we refer to him as a Renaissance humanist. And a lot of time the word humanism in our culture gets kind of separated from religion. He was a Christian humanist, and we sometimes use humanists to describe those people who don't have any particular religious ties. Um, Erasmus himself was a monk, and he was in, the, I think, the, the Brotherhood of the Common Order or something. I, I don't, didn't write it down for this. Um, but he was impressed, or he was, he was very unhappy with the way that things were going in the monasteries. And the reason he was is that people were not living a moral life. The, the monasteries were copying Bibles, doing all of the things that they, the monks had done. They were raising food. They were, they, were, they were functioning as communities. But from Erasmus's point of view, that most of the monastic communities didn't follow what he would call biblical piety. And that I think that what he's working with there is probably Sermon on the Mount, certainly the Ten Commandments. Um, he's saying biblical, the, the Bible should be a source for learning a way to live, not simply an authoritative text. And he himself, in looking at this, decided it was very important to come up with a translation of the Bible that would help people understand it. Now, he's not going vernacular, so that's that, he's not trying to get it in the common people's language. But he also felt that the church had to have an authoritative text. Erasmus was influenced by the new scholarly movement of humanism, and I, this is always one of those challenges. If I have anybody who's ever taken my 212 class, they know that what humanism is, the movement that took place, started in Italy, took place in Europe, of reviving classical texts and studying classical texts, that is, the books of the ancient Greeks and Romans. So the whole idea of humanism, in terms of its scholarship, was to go back to the source. The, it's always the notion that if you go back far enough, you're going to get to a more accurate and more real source. So Erasmus took this attitude of humanist learning, and instead of applying it to Aristotle or Plato and to commentaries on Aristotle and Plato, he decided he was going to go back and find all the earliest um, Greek and Hebrew versions of text from the Bible that he could find. And what he did then, which is a very strange thing, is he collated those and produced a Greek New Testament that he compared, and on one page, and that's what I love about this, on one side was the Greek New Testament, and you can see the Greek letters over there, and the other side was the Latin. It was the Vulgate, but it was Latin. But what he's doing that's different is he's going back to the original. He got rid of Moses' horns. Okay, so, and, and, and I think Erasmus was extremely influential partially because of this, but also because he was so respected across Europe in humanist circles. He became, he was invited to England and he became the Lady Margaret Professor of Greek at Cambridge. And remember, nobody had been studying Greek since the ancient world in Western Christianity. Mm -hmm.